It's time to kick anxiety to the curb. Release it all with a night of girl talk and encouragement. Join us for a Love Life Girls Night in with Joyce, a live streaming event featuring worship with Katie and Brian Torwalt, a lively talk it out discussion with guest Love McPherson, and Joyce teaching us to tackle anxiety head on. If you wake up in the morning and the first thing you start hearing is everything that you did wrong yesterday, it's not God. Friday, January 27th at 8 p.m. Eastern. Register today at joycemeyer.org slash live stream. This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. Satan will try to belittle you. He'll try to make you feel small. He'll try to make you feel incapable and unable. But God is on your side. And there are many things that I cannot do by myself, but I honestly believe that with God, putting my faith in Him, I can do whatever He asks me to do. Well, thank you for joining me today on Enjoying Everyday Life. You know, the last two days we've been talking about the importance of not wasting the resources that God gives us. We're going to finish up that teaching today. But I just want to reiterate to you how important I think this is. When Jesus fed the 5,000, he said, gather up the fragments that nothing be wasted. And they gathered up 12 baskets full when actually he started with some couple of fish and a little bit of bread. And so the result was they ended up with more left over than what they even started with because Jesus multiplied what they had. And he'll do that in our lives too. He'll multiply what we have if we're willing to do the right thing with what he gives us. And so we all have resources. We talked about time. We talked about money. And we started talking about energy, and I'm going to pick up kind of where I left off yesterday because there's so many people in the world that are tired, they're worn out, and part of it is because they have wasted a lot of their energy on the front end of their life, and now they don't have the energy that they need. Sometimes the more you move, the more energy you have, and today, literally, Things are so easy for us that we don't have to put out much effort. I mean, when I was a a kid growing up, nobody went to a gym to exercise. People worked hard enough to get the exercise that they needed. But that's not necessarily the case today. You have to almost sometimes on purpose make sure that you get some movement in your body. You know, if you don't move, things will start to get stiff. I like one saying that I heard, the more you move, the more you can move. The less you move, the less you can move. And no matter what your age is, you are going to get older. I don't want to say old, but older. And you want to have energy left in the latter years of your life so You don't just feel bad all the time. And I made mistakes. Thank God he's helped me to recover from some of the mistakes that I made in overworking and not exercising and not doing the right things. But I don't want you to make the mistakes that I made. So we all have a certain amount of energy. Some have more than others. But we need to manage that energy well. And like, for example, something that you might not think of, do you know that to get really mad takes a lot of energy? You stay mad for several hours and it just will wear you out. Worry is another thing that will just make you so tired. Wrong thinking, being judgmental, being critical, being negative, being, never being thankful for what you have. All those things, are they're, they're not things that God approves of, and they do take energy. They wear you out, and the, more, the happier you are, the better you're going to feel. 
And we're not going to be happy if we don't follow the precepts of God. If we're doing things that he doesn't approve of, it's going to steal our energy and we're not going to feel the way that we would like to feel. And I think a lot of people is like, why do I feel bad? Why do I feel bad? And they don't even think about things like worry or jealousy or, or greed or not getting enough exercise. And so we can pray for healing all we want to, but although God's desire is to heal us, he also wants us to do what we need to do to have good health. I frequently say now, I don't have, I don't have the time or the energy to be upset. There's so many things that we get upset about that just are not worth being upset about. I look back at my life now and some of the things that I used to get so mad at Dave over, and I think now how, just how ridiculous it was because it really didn't amount to that much. Now, in John 14, 27, Jesus said, My peace I leave with you. I give to you. He bequeathed it to us. It was like part of his inheritance. He said, my own special peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give you, but my peace I give you. And then the Amplified Bible says, so stop allowing yourselves to be upset and disturbed. Stop allowing yourselves to be fearful and intimidated. Well, that pretty much says it. Jesus said, I've given you peace. To be honest, you don't even have to pray for peace. You have peace on the inside of you. It's a gift from God. But we do have to make the decision to live in a way that that peace can be released. And so he says, stop being fearful, stop being upset, stop being worried and intimidated. All those negative emotions steal your energy. I just have a feeling that there are people watching today, you never thought of it like that. How many negative emotions do you allow in your life? How much of the time are you angry? How much of the time do you spend worrying? Do you get decent sleep at night? Even things not, like not drinking enough water can make you feel bad. There's a story, a true story, about David and his brothers and Goliath that I want to use as an example in this area. And it's in 1 Samuel 17, 23 through 30. And actually there was a giant named Goliath that was taunting the armies of Israel and threatening them. But not one of the soldiers in the army had the nerve to fight him. He frightened all of them. And David was a shepherd boy. He was young and he wasn't in the army. But his father sent him to the battle lines to take some food to his brothers and to see how the battle was going. And when David got there, it really bothered him that everybody was afraid of this Goliath instead of realizing how great their God was and that God would take care of them if they would step out in faith. And it says, now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. So those were some pretty big blessings that they were being offered if anybody would just have the nerve and really the confidence in God to step out. You know, on our own, there's a lot of things we can't do. But with God on our side, there's nothing that we can't do if God wants us to do it. And so when David came to the battle line, it says he asked the men standing near, what is going to be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? See, David thought it was an absolute disgrace that all the soldiers were standing around letting this giant taunt them. David had his faith in God, and he believed that God would give the man who stepped out the courage and the victory. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You can hear David's faith right there. But Eliab, who was one of David's brothers, and I might just add that his brothers were jealous of him because he had been anointed to be king instead of one of them. And 
Eliab was David's oldest brother, and he would have surely thought that he should have had that anointing, not David, the youngest brother, who was just a shepherd. And when Eliab heard David speaking with the men, he burned with anger, and he said to him, Why have you come down here, and with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? You know, he was trying to belittle David. With whom did you leave those few sheep, and who do you think that you are? And I just want to encourage you to realize that Satan will try to belittle you. He'll try to make you feel small. He'll try to make you feel incapable and unable. But God is on your side. And there are many things that I cannot do by myself, but I honestly believe that with God, putting my faith in him, I can do whatever he asks me to do. I can't just do whatever I want to do, but I can do whatever he asks me to do. And I love to be with confident people who believe that they can do something, even if it's something they've never done before. And they'll step out boldly and at least give it a try. Why have you come down here and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? Now, this was an opportunity for David to get his feelings hurt, to get offended, to get angry, to get emotionally upset. And his brother went on to say, I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You only came down here to watch the battle. And David said, now what have I done? Which leads me to believe that he was accustomed to this kind of treatment. It wasn't anything new for him. Now what have I done? And David said, can't I even speak? And then he turned away from Eliab to someone else. I love that. He turned away from the offense. He turned away from all the stupid things that his brother was saying that could have upset him because he wasn't going to waste his energy on negative emotions trying to argue with somebody that was behaving foolishly. Please get that. How many times do you let the devil use somebody to draw you into a foolish argument that you're not going to win? Because if people already have their mind made up about you, you're not going to change it. You don't even really need to try to defend yourself. You just need to trust God. And what we should do is just turn away and turn towards something more positive. He turned away to someone else and he brought up the same matter and the man answered him as before. Well, it turns out that David did kill Goliath, and I won't go on to tell you more of that story, but I just wanted to use that example of how Eliab was being used by the devil to try to belittle David, to get him upset, and he could have wasted his energies with those negative emotions and maybe not been able to win the battle. And he actually did win the battle, but in a very unique way, he killed this giant with a slingshot. And so surely we understand that God had to be directing that or it would have never worked. And you know, I was the least likely person to succeed when God called me to do what I'm doing. But I'm telling you, no matter how little you feel like you have in the natural, if you'll be obedient to God, you will be amazed at what God can use you for and what he can allow you today. I want you to be encouraged today that you are stronger than you think you are. And don't get your head full of that thinking, I can't do this, I can't do that, I'm not this, I'm not that. Believe what God says about you, not what the enemy says about you, often through other people. Don't waste your energy on useless projects or things that bear no real fruit. For example, trying to change a stubborn person's mind. You know, if somebody's got their mind made up about a certain thing, they're not likely to change it because they don't, don't even really want to listen to you. Or how about the uselessness of trying to change a person? You know, nobody's going to change if they don't really want to change. You have to want to know the truth in order to be willing to listen to the truth and change. Only God can change a human being. 
Are you wearing yourself out trying to change your spouse or trying to change one of your kids or trying to change a friend or another relative? It's not going to work. You'd be better off spending that time praying and God can do in just a moment of time what you couldn't get done in a lifetime. A physical trainer once told me that if I exercise too fast, I was wasting my time exercising that I needed to slow down. But I like to do things fast and get it over with. We just need to listen to God and do things the way he wants us to do them. So sometimes we can be doing the right thing, but doing it the wrong way. Just like maybe somebody in your life does need to change, but you're not going to change them. However, you can pray that God will do what needs to be done. Do you feel like you're forever spinning your wheels and never getting anywhere? Well, you may be letting some of these negative emotions steal all your energy. Be sure you use your energy that God has given you. And energy is a wonderful resource. It's so wonderful to feel good, to have energy to do things and to have a clear mind and to not be stiff and sore all over. Take care of yourself. Your health is one of the resources that God has given you. Now, the last thing that we're going to talk about in this three-part teaching is the talents, abilities, and giftings that God has given you. What are you doing with the gifts that God has given you? You know, we can all do something, but we can't all do the same thing. We're not all called to do the same thing. And sometimes we have a little bit of a difficult time deciding what it is we're called to do. And I think one of the most frequently asked questions is how do I know what God's called me to do? Well, I tell people just start trying to do a few things and pretty soon you'll find out what fits and what doesn't. I love the Lord so much and when I became a serious Christian, one who really wanted to obey God and wanted to walk in His will, I wanted to serve God, but I didn't know exactly what I was called to do. And so I just laid my hand to whatever was in front of me to do. And you know, it really didn't take me very long to find out what God wanted me to do because I tried things that just didn't work. They didn't fit. They, they weren't comfortable for me. And I like to use the example of maybe going out to buy an outfit for a party you're going to and you try something on that doesn't fit or you're not comfortable. Well, you don't take that. You try on something else. You keep trying things until you find the right thing. And that's what we need to do. I want to assure you today that you are talented you do have gifts, and you do have abilities, and don't ever let anybody make you feel stupid or that you can't do anything worthwhile. Did you hear me? Don't let other people make you feel like you're useless or stupid or that you don't have talents or abilities. Don't, do not compare yourself with other people because you're not supposed to be doing what they're doing. You're supposed to be doing the part that God is giving you. And all parts are important. And to God, they're all counted equally. Now, Matthew 25, verse 14 through 28. And I may ad lib this a little bit, but he said, it's going to be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. Well, that's like Jesus. He... He left, he went to heaven, sent the Holy Spirit, but he also gave gifts to men, the Bible says. He gave us abilities, and, and altogether we have the ability to spread the gospel around the whole earth, and Jesus gave the Holy Spirit to teach us, to lead us, to guide us, to direct us. So we have what we need to do the job. To one, to one he gave five bags of gold, to another two, and to another one, each according to his ability. That's why we should not look at, <coughs> excuse me, look at what somebody else has and be jealous of them, but just believe that whatever God has given us, he's given us for the job he's given us to do, and he's given it to us according to the ability that we have. Be happy to be who you are. Don't be upset today because you don't look like somebody else or you can't do what somebody else can do. 
The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. He didn't waste his. He put it to work right away. He invested it, and it increased. The man who had two bags of gold went right away, and he gained two more. But the man who had one, and this shows why he only got one, went and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money because he was afraid. Because he was afraid. So out of fear, he did nothing. Rather than be wrong, he did nothing. Can I tell you something? You're never going to find out if you can be right if you're not willing to be wrong. We all make mistakes. I think we fail our way to success, you might say. After a long time, the master returned. And you know what? Jesus is coming back. And the Bible says that we are all going to stand before God and we're going to give an account of our life and what we did. Now, you're not going to be judged on your salvation if you're a true believer in Jesus Christ. You're saved because you believe in him, not because of your works. But the Bible teaches us that there will be rewards for our works that were pure and done with pure motives. And I don't know about you, but I want all the rewards I can get. I like to say payday is coming. I don't know, maybe you've been working in the nursery at church and nobody ever thanks you or nobody ever even seems to know that you exist, but God sees you and God knows what you're doing. And if you do it unto the Lord, your reward will come from the Lord. Everybody who works in God's kingdom and does it for the right motive is going to receive a reward. So after a long time, the master returned and he required an accounting of what they had done with what he had given them. And then he goes through and to the man who gained five more, he said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. The same thing with the man who gave two, but the one, the man who had one and he buried it, he called him a wicked, lazy servant. And he hid it out of fear. So since the man was not using what God had given him, he took it away from him and gave it to the man who had five bags. Well, actually had 10 bags by now. And so it's very simple to see you either use it or you lose it. Are you using the gifts and the abilities and the talents that you have, not just to make money for yourself, but are you using some of them in the service of God to help expand his kingdom or to just be a blessing to somebody else? Acts 10.38 says, See how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good. You know, I believe all of us can just get up every day and go about doing good. I want, to do, I want my life to do some good for somebody else. I don't want to just try to make myself happy. I want to make other people happy. And when you make other people happy, it makes you happy because it's a way of giving. You're giving joy and then God gives joy back to you. And so I want to say again, what are you doing to make somebody else's life better? I think it's a question we need to ask ourselves. Do something for somebody else every day. Encourage them. Say something to them that's going to put a smile on their face. Help meet a need that they have. Be a blessing. Appreciate them. Say thank you. Fear causes many people to waste their talents. You know, laziness is another cause of much waste. People are just lazy. They, they don't want to do anything that requires any effort out of them. And, you know, things are pretty easy for us in the world today. We don't have to walk up steps. We can take an escalator or we can take an elevator. When I first started studying the Bible, boy, it was, it was hard work. You had to have all these resource materials. Now all you have to do is just put a message in a computer and up pops all the answers that you want. But you know what? I'm glad I had those years of having to work at really studying because that's when I really got the word way down deep on the inside of me and learned many of the things that I'm teaching you now. A lack of discipline is another reason why people don't really make use of their gifts and talents is 
They just don't, they don't discipline themselves to put their efforts and energies into the things they should be putting them into. <clears throat> you know, I have a lot of goals and a lot of things that I would love to do. But you know what? I'm not going to meet all those goals and I'm not going to get to do them all because although there's things that I would like to do that I can't do anymore, I am giving myself to what God wants me to do right now. And that's important. You have to decide what you're going to do with your time. And I think it was John Maxwell that said you should give 80% of your time to your top three priorities. So let's just say I'm a decent preacher, so I should get, give my time to communicating with people the Word of God. I'm not a good singer, so what good would it do me to keep trying to sing? That would just be time wasted. So maybe you're spending your time trying to be good at what somebody else can do, and you're not using your time trying to improve in what you can do. Know your gifts. Know your calling. Know your destiny. Have goals. And put 80% of your time into your top three priorities. God loves you and he wants to use you. And Romans 14, 12 says, So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. When I stand before God, I don't want to be able to say, Gosh, Lord, I'm sorry I wasted so much of my time and I wasted my talents and I wasted my energy and I wasted my money. I want to be able to say, I took what you gave me and I invested it and I did the very best that I could with it. And I want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And I believe that you want that too. Today I'm offering you a book that I've written called Seize the Day. Take each day and seize it and don't let the day rule you, but you rule the day. We're offering you this book today for your gift to the ministry, your financial gift of any amount. All I ask is that you do your best. Every day when I teach, I try to give you my best, and I just ask that you do your best, and I believe that you're going to really enjoy this book, and it's going to help stir you up to start really doing more good things than what you've ever done in the past. Thank you for being with me today. I really appreciate it. And I pray for you that you will have a great rest of the day. God bless you. Did you know that you can be completely honest with God? David in the Bible certainly was. He poured out his questions and pain and discovered how deeply God loved him through it all. You can too. That's why I'm so excited about this devotional, Daily Devotions from Psalms. As you take time to know God in a deeper way, you will find comfort and peace every single day. Daily Devotions from Psalms, new from Joyce Meyer. Order your copy today. I love that magazine she sends out. There's something in there for everybody. The Enjoying Everyday Life magazine is free. Subscribe at JoyceMeyer.org to read encouraging articles from Joyce and much more. Reading through the magazine confirms for me God's at work. We hope you enjoyed today's program. For more information, visit JoyceMeyer.org. This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. Welcome to Enjoying Everyday Life with New York Times bestselling author, Joyce Meyer. On today's program, Joyce will be teaching from her series, Psalm 23, The Lord is My Shepherd. We all have moments in life when we feel overwhelmed, times when we need direction and protection. The psalmist David experienced these feelings, yet he also knew the one who could lead him through life's dark valleys. David knew that as our good shepherd, God wants to provide for us every single day. Today, Joyce takes a deeper look at David's Psalm 23, breaking it down verse by verse, revealing the freedom we can have when we follow God's leading. Now, here's Joyce with today's teaching. 
Well, I'm teaching out of the 23rd Psalm, and so far I've made it through two verses and the first sentence of another one. And tonight I'm actually going to do, I think, another maybe verse and a half, something like that. And all the rest of it I'm going to do in the morning. And you think, well, that's not possible. Oh, well, yes, it is. Yes, it is. I've got a plan. So we're going to look at Psalm 23 again, because we have lots of new people here tonight. As I've been saying, this is probably like the go-to psalm in the Bible. When people are hurting, they go to Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Made a point last night that he's my shepherd. When you look at it, you need to think he is my shepherd, not just a shepherd, but the Lord is your shepherd. He wants a personal, intimate relationship with you. I shall not lack. That doesn't mean that you're going to have everything you want the moment that you want it all the time, but it means that even while you're waiting for the things you want God to do, you can be content. Contentment is great. He makes me lie down in fresh, tender green pastures. If you won't do it on your own, he'll be happy to make you. He leads me beside the still and the restful waters. That's talking about entering the rest of God. It's just absolutely the most wonderful place to be in. He refreshes and restores my life, myself, or my soul. Now, that's as far as we got this morning. And we talked about the soul being our mind, our will, and our emotions, and how God has to work in those areas, and how he changes us, and loves us into wholeness, but how that also requires us receiving correction from God, and how we respond to that correction a lot of times in not such a great way. Now, I'm making a lot of analogies about sheep. Jesus being the shepherd and us being the sheep. And there are some sheep facts that are kind of interesting. Number one, they don't instinctively take care of themselves like many other animals do. So they constantly need a caretaker. They're wanderers. They will wander out of the place where they're going to be the safest if they don't have a good shepherd to keep bringing them back. They're actually not very intelligent. They're considered to be kind of dumb and they, they sometimes get, they get cast down. And we see that word in the Psalms. David said, why so cast down, O my soul? And when a sheep is cast down, it has gotten rolled over on its back and can't get up without some help. And then sometimes they get too much wool and they have to be sheared. And so that's kind of where we were at when we stopped this morning. Now tonight I have one thing that I want to get across to you. And if it takes me the whole hour that I'll teach to do that, so be it. But I want you to leave here with one thing tonight. I was going to go in some other areas, but I'm saving all the rest of it for tomorrow. He leads me in the paths of righteousness, uprightness and right standing with him. Not because I've earned it, but for his name's sake. Now, let me just say a word about righteousness and right standing with God. Most of us spend most of our life feeling bad about ourselves feeling guilty and condemned, ashamed, and like there's something wrong with us. You ever had that record playing in your head, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with me? Anybody ever hear that? What's wrong with me, what's wrong with me? And the devil wants to give us wrongness. He wants us to feel that we're wrong, that everything we do is wrong, that we're just not what we should be. And Jesus wants to give us righteousness, our rightness. And you can't produce something that you don't have in you. An apple tree can only make apples because God has made it an apple tree. And so it's foolish to teach people to behave right if they've not first received the righteousness of God through Christ. That's why just what I refer to as religion, and I don't mean to be rude by that, but when I talk about religion, I'm talking about just uh, following rules and regulations and going through formulas that really have no life and no power in them. Just keeping laws that you think are going to please God when really Jesus didn't die so we could all have our own little brand of religion. He died so we could have an intimate personal relationship with God through him. When Jesus died on the cross, the, the thick, three feet thick curtain that separated, that was in the, the temple, that separated the holy place from the most holy place, was ripped 
from the top to the bottom at the moment that Jesus died? Why not from the bottom up? There was a point being made. It was too tall for man to reach it. It being ripped from the top to the bottom was clear indication that God was opening up the way now for the common, ordinary, everyday person to enter into the holy presence of God and have fellowship with him. So you've been invited into intimacy with God. That's what it means to be born again. If you've never received Christ as your savior, at the close of this message tonight, we're gonna to give you an opportunity to do that. He's, we're not inviting you to be part of a certain religion. We would advise that you get involved in a good local home church for accountability, for teaching, for fellowship, for worship. Lots, lots of, the local church is great, but we don't just need religion. And so religion sometimes just gives you, gives you a bunch of things to do but never teaches you who you are in Christ. Now, I went to a church for many, many, many years, and although I learned some very good things, uh, they had a good message about grace, and I learned about being saved through grace, and I, I learned a lot about doctrinal things, the virgin birth, and lots of really, really, really good things, but I, nobody ever taught me who I was in Christ. I never felt any better about myself at all because I had a relationship with God. I still just thought that I was this terrible mess that just could never do anything other than just mess up every single day of my life. And so in 2 Corinthians 5.21, one of my favorite scriptures, it says that he that knew no sin became sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, it's just important for me to take a minute and let you know that if you're a born-again Christian, then God views you as being in right standing with him, irregardless of what you do. And I know that's really hard for us to wrap our heads around. You think, well, won't that just give people a license to sin? No, because here's the thing. Once you know really who you are in Christ and the beauty of what he's done for you, sin is the last thing that you're gonna wanna do. You're gonna do everything that you can to please God, not to be right with him, but because you've been made right with him. Amen? So, no condemnation of those who are in Christ. So, it's important for me to let you know that you have a right standing with God and you're in the process now of walking that out in your life. There's several ways I can say it, but I can say we're always in the process of becoming what we already are. So, we're, not, we're spirit, so spiritually we've been made right with God, but now in, in our experience, we're learning how to walk that out with God. I made the righteousness of God when I am born again, but then I get on the path of righteousness and the Bible says that he makes our path brighter and brighter every day. Let's look at Proverbs 4.18. That's why serving God is just so much fun. Proverbs 4.18, we're gonna go back to Psalm 23. I just realized I didn't finish it. I wanna do that. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines more and more brighter and brighter until it reaches its full strength in the perfect day. And so here's the thing, we're always going to be growing spiritually as long as we're here on this earth, we're going to be growing, we're going toward a point of perfection, but we will not finally be perfected in our experience until Jesus shows up and he finishes whatever's lacking in us. And God is not mad at anybody if they haven't arrived, but he is disappointed for our sakes if we don't keep pressing on. And so therefore, I am very proud of you. I wanna compliment you that you took a Friday night out of your life and you have traveled and many of you paid for hotel bills. It's cost you something to come here just to worship God and to hear his word. And that means that you are a serious believer. And I wanna tell you something, God is proud of you that you care enough about him to do what you need to do to grow spiritually. Anybody who watches me for very long, you know that I don't serve up much dessert. Most of what I put out is meat and vegetables and spinach and stuff you could do without, but boy, if you stick with it, it'll sure help you grow. We get a little dessert every once in a while just to keep people from, you know, wanting to go hang themselves, but the truth is, is we, the truth is, is we need strong meat. I mean, the devil's alive and well on planet Earth and things are pretty tough out there and we need to be pretty determined that we're gonna stick with God and be all that God wants us to be if we're gonna do that. So we're in a process of change, we're in a process of growth. 
I'm not where I need to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. I'm okay and I'm on my way. So everybody say, I'm not mad at myself. I'm on my way. Now let's just go back to Psalm 23 here. He leads me in the paths of righteousness, not because I've earned it, but for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Now we're gonna stop there and all the rest of that, I'll read it, but the rest of this we're gonna save for tomorrow morning. We're gonna have some real fun tomorrow. For you, are, for you are with me. Your rod protects me. Your staff guides me. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely only goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, you lead me in the paths of righteousness. Yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Now, here's the message that I want to get across to you. And I'm going to tell you up front what it is, and then I'm going to spend the rest of the time re-reminding you and convincing you that what I'm saying is scriptural. Even though you're doing the right thing, and you're on the right path, and you're growing in God, you're pressing on in righteousness, your path is becoming brighter and brighter every day, that does not necessarily mean that you won't pass through what the Bible calls the shadow of the valley of death, which basically just means hard times. <laughs> so we got rid of, gotta get rid of any kind of thinking, well, you know, I'm doing all this stuff and I'm trying to do what's right and the right thing's not happening to me and I'm just tired of this, so I'm just gonna quit and give up. We need to leave the timing of our results in God's hands our job is not results, our job is obedience. We do what we do, not even to just get a result, but because that's what we believe God wants us to do, and we know that if we do what is right, we will have peace, and listen to me, there is, there is no way that we can ever fail and not be delivered if we're doing what's right. Amen. Thanks for listening. Grow closer to Jesus in a more honest and heartfelt way with today's offer, Daily Devotions from Psalms Devotional and Brand New Day 365-Day Journey Through the Word Calendar. This 365-day devotional and encouraging desktop calendar are available now for a gift of $30 or more in U.S. funds, and we do accept all major credit cards. You can order today's offer from our website at JoyceMeyer.org or call us toll-free at 1-800-789-0089. Again, the number is 1-800-789-0089. Well, I hope that you feel that I'm a partner in your life by teaching you the Word of God. And I'm asking you to partner with me in helping us continue reaching out not only to you through this program, but to so many people around the world that still don't know Jesus. Together, we can do so much more than what we can do by ourselves. So please, become a brand new partner with us today. To join us in partnership right now, go to JoyceMeyer.org. Thank you so much. Thanks again for listening to Enjoying Everyday Life. Our mission here at Joyce Meyer Ministries is simple, sharing Christ and loving people. Remember, together we can do more.
This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. Well, thank you for joining me today on Enjoying Everyday Life. Today, I'm going to be talking about doing life with God, not dividing our life up into these are spiritual things, so they're sacred, and all these other things are secular things, and so they're kind of unimportant, and I need to rush through these so I can get back to being spiritual because maybe I feel like that God likes me more when I'm being spiritual. If I'm in church, I feel spiritual. If I'm studying or praying, I feel spiritual. But if I got to do the laundry, then yuck, that's not spiritual. If you remember in the Bible, God had called Moses to lead the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and to take them through the wilderness into the promised land. And Moses got ahead of himself and tried to, he had something in his heart, but he didn't have the timing right. And he tried to help some of the Israelites before God was ready. And he ran for fear out into the wilderness. And he was out there for 40 years being a sheep herder. And he got married and had some kids and, you know, all these things. And then one day he saw a bush just a regular plain old bush that was on fire. And so the Bible says that he went to see what it was. And God spoke to him out of the bush and said, take your sandals off your feet for the ground on which you stand is holy ground. Now, it was really just a plot of dirt and a bush But the fire in that bush was God. So that ground became sacred because God was on it. And that's what I want to try to teach you today, that everything that we do with and for God is sanctified and can become holy. Now, there are some things, obviously, that are more spiritually beneficial than other things, but... For example, the pastor of the church isn't necessarily any more sacred than the mom at home raising three or four little kids. If we do what we do with and for God because of our love for him, that's what makes it special. That's what makes it sanctified. For many, many, many years, I divided my love, my life up into all these. These were secular, and these few things were spiritual. And I only felt good about myself when I was doing the spiritual things because I felt like those things pleased God. But God wants us to do everything with and for Him, and then, just like that bush, was just a plain old bush and a plain old plot of dirt. But because God was there, it became sacred and holy. So the same thing can happen in our daily life if we learn how to do life with God. Like, if you're cleaning your house, that can be a pretty boring, mundane job. But if you do it with God, help me with this, Lord. I want to do this with you. While you're doing it, you tell the Lord you love him. You have a melody in your heart. You're cleaning away, but you're thanking God that you've got a house. You're thanking God you've got something to clean. What you're doing becomes a holy thing because now you're doing it for God. You're not just doing it because you have to do it. You're doing it for God. The Bible says that we are to acknowledge God in all of our ways. And when we do, he will direct our path. Now, to acknowledge God is not that difficult. It's not like you've got to have a 30-minute prayer meeting to see if it's okay. You just say, 
going to the grocery store, Lord. I want you to be with me and guide me and lead me. And, you know, some of you may think, ah, oh, that's going a little bit too far. You know, I don't want to, I mean, it's just the grocery store. Well, you can do what you want, but I want to do my life with God. Paul said, in him we live and move and have our being. That's Acts 17, 28. In him we live and move and have our being. Well, I don't really know what Paul was saying other than God is everything to me and everything I do, I do it with him and everything I do, I do it for him because he's everything. And I'll tell you, my life changed so much when I learned that because for many, many years, all I did was go to church on Sunday And when I would have some big disaster, I would pray. And I read one chapter in the Bible every day just out of obligation. Prayed a little three-second prayer at night. And that was the total sum of my spiritual life. But God wants to be involved in everything that we do. He wants, he doesn't want us to be lukewarm. He wants us to give him our whole life. If you seek God with all of your heart, you'll be amazed what will begin to happen in your life. And I'm particularly fond of Romans 11:36 in the Amplified Bible. It says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. For all things originate with him and come from him. All things live through him and all things center in and tend to consummate and to end in him. To him be the glory. I'm going to read this again just to make sure you get it. Because this is basically telling us God's involved in everything. But if I don't think like that, then it's not going to mean anything to me. For from him and through him and to him are all things. All things. In Colossians, it says, and whatever you do, Colossians 3, 17 and 23, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Wow. What's that saying other than do life with God? You know, we've had people tell us here who work at the ministry, I love what I'm doing so much, I can't believe I get paid to do this. Well, see, when we when we do what we do for God, we can feel that way about life. Because when you do what you do with God on your mind and you're doing it for Him and through Him and you're depending on Him and you're relying on Him and you're leaning on Him and you're thanking Him, You avoid all the craziness in the world. And you're not even necessarily going to work just to get a paycheck or for whatever reason, but you're just, you're living your life for God. Everything. If I go to the grocery store, I want to know that God's with me. If I clean my house, I want to know that, you know, even getting dressed in the morning, many times I say, God, I want, to, I want to get dressed for you. I want to look good for you. Let's do everything for God. Commit your way unto him, and he'll bring it to pass. Whatever you do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Work at it with all your heart, with zeal and passion. Boy. We gotta have passion for what we do. We gotta be zealous and enthusiastic for what we do. My life has changed so much since God has taught me this. You know, I'm comfortable with God and whatever I'm doing. It's like going to the grocery store wouldn't be that much different for me than Going to church. Now, going to church might be more spiritually beneficial, but God is with me in the grocery store just like he is in the church. It might be a whole brand new way of thinking, but stop dividing up your life into sacred and secular and do everything you do with God. I I hope you get this because I've only got just about a half an hour to present this to you. 
So I'm so comfortable with God now. I feel like he's not only my sovereign, holy, amazing father, but he's my friend. I never feel that I need to hide anything from God. I have a reverential fear and awe of God, but I'm not afraid of him. I'm not afraid that he's angry with me because I made a mistake. I'm comfortable talking to him about my mistakes and my sins because he already knows it all anyway. When God corrects me, chastises me, I appreciate it because I know that he's doing it out of love. Don't you want to be comfortable with God, have a comfortable, relaxing, loving relationship with him? If you stop dividing your life up into sacred and secular and you decide that everything is going to be sacred because you're going to do it all with and for God. In him, you're going to live and move and have your being. Like Jesus said in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. And that's what I want to believe. Psalm 127, 1 says, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Well, interestingly enough, it doesn't say that you can't build it. But it says your labor will be in vain. You might create something or build something or build some big business, but if you're doing it so you feel important, so you make a lot of money, you're not doing it for God, you're not doing it with God. No, you go to church on Sunday. You pray when you have a big disaster, but most of the time you don't need God. You just do it on your own. You're kind of proud of yourself that you've been a success. But you know what? All that is wasted. It's all in vain. You can build it, but it's not going to give you joy. It's not going to give you peace. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. No matter what we do, if it's not done with God, it won't work the way that it is supposed to work. Matthew sixteen twenty six says, what good would it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? I want to ask you a question. You may have to think about it when the program's over, but who and what are you living for? Who and what are you living for? Are you living for God? Are you doing what you do because you believe you're doing it in obedience to him and because you love him? Or are you just kind of doing what you want to do and asking God to bless it? You know, we don't plan and then pray God will make our plan work. We pray for God to give us the plan. And then we walk the way he wants us to walk. Our greatest fear, I didn't say this, but I read this somewhere and I think it's great. Our greatest fear should not be in failing but in succeeding at things that really don't matter. Wow. What are you putting your time into? Is it something that matters? Is it something that matters to God? You don't have to be in ministry, public ministry, on a platform to be in ministry. I think we're all called into ministry, but your pulpit might be your backyard fence. And you don't necessarily have to preach to everybody. You just need to get out in the world and live your life with and for God. He's not a sideline. He's the main line. I want you to enjoy your walk with God. For in him we live and move and have our being. Okay, now here comes a scripture that could be just a little bit mm, ouchy. But I think we want to read this today. Revelation 3.16. So because you're lukewarm, and that's what I used to be, lukewarm. I mean, I loved God. I was born again. I believe I would have gone to heaven if I would have died. Our salvation is not purchased with any of our works. But we do earn or lose rewards for how we live our life. And what we do while we're here. So I would have gone to heaven, but I would have never enjoyed my life. 
And the Bible says in John 10:10, 10, 10, the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came that you might have and enjoy your life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. Well, I didn't have that. I didn't have that. I didn't have joy. I didn't have peace. I was not enjoying my life. I was even in ministry, and I wasn't enjoying that because I was too busy trying to impress people or impress myself. I, I don't know. I loved God, but I wasn't living my whole life with and for God. I was still dividing all these things up. I was lukewarm. And God wants us to be zealous, passionate, enthusiastic, on fire. Paul told Timothy, stir up those embers that are in you. Get passionate again like you once were. For the work of God and for God. You know, sometimes when we first come into a relationship with God, we're so excited and we're so passionate and we just we want to study the word all the time. And we want to do things for people. And we want to give. And boy, if you're not careful, after a while, what was once a raging fire can just become a few embers. Well, Timothy still had a few hot coals in there. But God said, you, you got to, through Paul, he said, you got to stir yourself up. And I want to encourage you today, if you're just kind of a lukewarm Christian, stir yourself up. You say, well, how do I do that? Well, one of the ways you can do it is by sitting around and just really thinking about what God has done for you and what your life would be like without him. And start doing everything you do. Just whisper a little prayer. God, I want to do this with you today. I want to do this for you today. I'm going to the grocery store, but if you can use me while I'm there to be a blessing to anybody, show me what you want me to do. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Of course, I can't hear you saying yes or no, but I'm going to believe you're saying yes, Joyce. We get it. I kind of hate to read this next part to you, but it's here, so I have to do it. Revelation 3.16. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold... I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Now, I'm going to be very honest with you. I don't really know for sure what that means, but it sounds bad enough that I don't even think I want to look into it. Nothing is worse when you're really thirsty than something lukewarm. And let me tell you, we have got a thirsty world, a hungry and a thirsty world that's looking For something, they don't even know what it is. They're looking for God, but they're trying to fill up that emptiness in them with all kinds of other things. And those of us that are Christians, we're the only Jesus that they're ever going to see. And we need to get on fire for God, get a smile on our face. There's nothing worse than a sourpuss Christian. Get a smile on your face. Go to work. Don't complain and grumble like everybody else. But when everybody else is complaining, say something positive. Well, I'm thankful that I have a job. All the circumstances may not be perfect, but I'm thankful I have a job. There's so much negativity in the world today. I am so tired of all the negativity that we can inject some positivity everywhere that we go. Be in love with God. Don't just love him, but be in love with him. I kind of remember when I made that transition. It's like, I love you, but it's more than that. I'm I'm in love with you. I can't live without you. I can't. Who would want to even get up in the morning if they didn't have Jesus? I wouldn't see any purpose in it. And I have to stir myself up sometimes. You know, I work pretty hard at what I'm doing, and I study the Bible all the time, and I write all the time, and sometimes I'm like, "Hmm." but then I remember how blessed I am that God could have chosen anybody, but he chose me. And the good thing is, is you you are going to, you're going to like your life so much more if you stop dividing everything up and you believe that God is with you all the time the Bible says he'll never leave you nor forsake you but he'll be with you at all times in everything that you do and the Holy Spirit is sent to be our helper 
And God said he sent him, listen, to be in close fellowship with us. I love that close fellowship with us. God is with me right now as I preach, and he's with you as you listen. But when the program's over, you don't have to say, well, the spiritual part of the day is over. No, the next thing you do, you just do it with and for God too. I'm telling you, if you can get this, this will change your life. And it will bring so much joy into your life that you just won't hardly know what to do with yourself. I, I can't really even explain what a big difference it makes. It's like, okay, you're still cleaning your house, you're still doing your laundry, but now you're doing it for a different purpose. You're doing it because you love God and you want to take care of the things that he's given you. God loves us so much and the least, the very least that he deserves is our all. Maybe what I'm saying today is all or nothing. Don't be lukewarm. Don't be lukewarm. Be red hot on fire for God. The very least he deserves is our everything and our all. Acknowledge God in everything you do. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and mind and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. Another translation says acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. You know, something simple like going to the grocery store. I mean, you know, it can be a nightmare or it could be a pleasant trip. So if you acknowledge God when you go, Lord, shop with me, lead me, guide me, show me what to get. Help me. Let me tell you something. I, You know, maybe you're better than me, but I need help in everything I do. I need God to help me fix my hair. I need God to help me with everything. And I remember when God touched my life back in 1976. And I didn't know anything about living like this at all. As I said, I was a lukewarm Christian. And I did love God, but I, I wasn't in love with him. And he was important to me, but he wasn't my all and my everything. And I thought just because I went to church on Sunday and said a little prayer and read a little bit of the Bible that I was okay. But I don't want to just be okay. I want to be everything that God wants me to be. And so on a Friday, I think the month was February in 1976, I was crying out to God in my car on my way to work because I was just fed up with living the way I was living. Arguing with my husband, being mad at my kids, no joy, no peace, feeling sorry for myself all the time. That's not the way a Christian's supposed to live. And I cried out to God, God, you have to do something in my life. And you know what? I think I had just gotten desperate enough that I didn't care what it was as long as God didn't leave me the way that I was. And all I can tell you is on my way home from work that night, God touched me. His presence filled my car. And I felt like I'd been filled full of liquid love. Now, you might say, well, Joyce, I've never had an experience like that. Well, I don't think you have to have an experience. God knows what we all need, and he'll give each one of us what we need when we need it. If you start crying out to God to fill you, he will fill you. We all need to be full of the Holy Spirit, be baptized in the Holy Spirit, full of God. Not just a little bit will do you, but be full of God. And I bowled on Friday nights in a league. And this was a Friday when this happened, and I was still kind of like in the afterglow. I just felt, oh, everything was beautiful. Everything was wonderful. But I was bowling really bad that night. And I heard the Spirit of the Lord speak in my heart, why don't you ask me to help you bowl? And I thought, well, you don't care about my bowling. Now, see, that's where I was all wrong. God cared about everything that I did. He cared about my bowling. Well, you know what? I went ahead and I prayed, and I started bowling better. 
And I'm telling you that if you will let God into everything you do, whether it's your bowling or cleaning your house or driving to work in traffic or paying your bills or whatever it is, start doing life with God. Don't just try to do life on your own and then go to church on Sunday and be miserable the rest of the week. Oh, I wish I could see you so I could tell if you're getting this or not. Because I'll tell you, when God becomes the center of everything in your life, everything changes. You shall have no other gods before me. Let him be number one in your life, the most important thing in your life. Seek first the kingdom of God, and everything else will be added unto you. You know, our mind and how we think about all these things is so important, and today we're offering you my all-time best-selling book, it's over 20 years old, but it's still one of our best-selling books, The Battlefield of the Mind. We've sold almost 6 million copies of this book, and so that means it must be pretty good. And we're offering it to you today for your gift to the ministry of any amount. Just do the best. Send in the... Be generous. And we're going to use that money to help hurting people all over the globe, people that are hungry, people that are poor, people that are needy. We're going to use it to preach the gospel. And remember what I said. In him we live and move and have our being. Do life with God and dedicate everything you do to him and do it with him. We love you so much and I hope that you enjoyed today and that it helps you and changes your life. Thank you for watching. The Joyce Meyer Conference is back. If you will start crying out to God on a regular basis, I need more of you in my life. You better put on your seatbelt and get ready for the ride of your life. Coming to Hershey, Pennsylvania, November 4th and 5th with worship by Mac Brock. The way she connects with people, I mean, you can't help but to leave energized. For more information and a complete conference schedule, visit JoyceMeyer.org or call 1-866-C-JOYCE. Some people just push your buttons. And no matter how hard you try to love them, they take you from zero to on edge in no time flat. So how do you see the good in people when it's really hard to find? Joyce Meyer wants to show you in her new book, Loving People Who Are Hard to Love, a step-by-step survival guide to help you navigate those difficult relationships and a world in need of God's love. Loving that difficult person may not change the world, but it could change yours and theirs. Loving People Who Are Hard to Love. Order your copy today. We hope you enjoyed today's program. Please contact us or visit JoyceMeyer.org to share your prayer requests or partner with us in sharing Christ and loving people all across the globe. This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. Well, thank you for joining me today on Enjoying Everyday Life. Today, I'm going to be talking about doing life with God, not dividing our life up into these are spiritual things, so they're sacred, and all these other things are secular things, and so they're kind of unimportant, and I need to rush through these so I can get back to being spiritual because maybe I feel like that God likes me more when I'm being spiritual. If I'm in church, I feel spiritual. If I'm studying or praying, I feel spiritual. But if I got to do the laundry, then yuck, that's not spiritual. If you remember in the Bible, God had called Moses to lead the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and to take them through the wilderness into the promised land. And Moses got ahead of himself and tried to, he had something in his heart, but he didn't have the timing right. And he tried to 
help some of the Israelites before God was ready. And he ran for fear out into the wilderness. And he was out there for 40 years being a sheep herder. And he got married and had some kids and, you know, all these things. And then one day he saw a bush, just a regular plain old bush that was on fire. And so the Bible says that he went to see what it was. And God spoke to him out of the bush and said, Take your sandals off your feet, for the ground on which you stand is holy ground. Now, it was really just a plot of dirt and a bush, but the fire in that bush was God. So that ground became sacred because God was on it. And that's what I want to try to teach you today, that everything that we do with and for God is sanctified and can become holy. Now, there are some things, obviously, that are more spiritually beneficial than other things. But, for example, the pastor of the church isn't necessarily any more sacred than the mom at home raising three or four little kids. If we do what we do with and for God because of our love for him, that's what makes it special. That's what makes it sanctified. For many, many, many years, I divided my love, my life up into all these, these were secular and these few things were spiritual and, I only felt good about myself when I was doing the spiritual things because I felt like those things please God. But God wants us to do everything with and for him. And then just like that bush was just a plain old bush and a plain old plot of dirt, but because God was there, it became sacred and holy. So... The same thing can happen in our daily life if we learn how to do life with God. Like, if you're cleaning your house, that can be a pretty boring, mundane job. But if you do it with God, help me with this, Lord. I want to do this with you. While you're doing it, you tell the Lord you love him. You have a melody in your heart. You're cleaning away, but you're thanking God that you've got a house. You're thanking God you've got something to clean. What you're doing becomes a holy thing because now you're doing it for God. You're not just doing it because you have to do it. You're doing it for God. The Bible says that we are to acknowledge God in all of our ways. And when we do, he will direct our path. Now, to acknowledge God is not that difficult. It's not like you've got to have a 30-minute prayer meeting to see if it's okay. You just say, I'm going to the grocery store, Lord. I want you to be with me and guide me and lead me. And You know, some of you may think, oh, that's going a little bit too far. You know, I don't want to, I mean, it's just the grocery store. Well, you can do what you want, but I want to do my life with God. Paul said, in him we live and move and have our being. That's Acts 17, 28. In him we live and move and have our being. Well, I don't really know what Paul was saying other than God is everything to me, and everything I do, I do it with him, and everything I do, I do it for him, because he's everything. And I'll tell you, my life changed so much. When I learned that, because for many, many years, all I did was go to church on Sunday. And when I would have some big disaster, I would pray. And I read one chapter in the Bible every day, just out of obligation. Prayed a little three second prayer at night. And that was the total sum of my spiritual life. But God wants to be involved in everything that we do. He wants, he doesn't want us to be lukewarm. He wants us to give him 
our whole life. If you seek God with all of your heart, you'll be amazed what will begin to happen in your life. And I'm particularly fond of Romans 11:36 in the Amplified Bible. It says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. For all things originate with him and come from him. All things live through him and all things center in and tend to consummate and to end in him. To him be the glory. I'm going to read this again just to make sure you get it. Because this is basically telling us God's involved in everything. But if I don't think like that, then it's not going to mean anything to me. For from him and through him and to him are all things. All things. In Colossians, it says, and whatever you do, Colossians 3, 17 and 23, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Wow. What's that saying other than do life with God? You know, we've had people tell us here who work at the ministry, I love what I'm doing so much, I can't believe I get paid to do this. Well, see, when we, when we do what we do for God, we can feel that way about life. Because when you do what you do with God on your mind and you're doing it for Him and through Him and you're depending on Him and you're relying on Him and you're leaning on Him and you're thanking Him, You avoid all the craziness in the world. And you're not even necessarily going to work just to get a paycheck or for whatever reason, but you're just, you're living your life for God. Everything. If I go to the grocery store, I want to know that God's with me. If I clean my house, I want to know that, you know, even getting dressed in the morning, many times I say, God, I want to, I want to get dressed for you. I want to look good for you. Let's do everything for God. Commit your way unto him, and he'll bring it to pass. Whatever you do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Work at it with all your heart, with zeal and passion. Boy. We got to have passion for what we do. We got to be zealous and enthusiastic for what we do. My life has changed so much since God has taught me this. You know, I'm comfortable with God and whatever I'm doing. It's like going to the grocery store wouldn't be that much different for me than going to church. Now, going to church might be more spiritually beneficial, but God is with me in the grocery store just like he is in the church. It might be a whole brand new way of thinking, but stop dividing up your life into sacred and secular and do everything you do with God. I I hope you get this because I've only got just about a half an hour to present this to you. So I'm so comfortable with God now. I feel like he's not only my sovereign, holy, amazing father, but he's my friend. I never feel that I need to hide anything from God. I have a reverential fear and awe of God, but I'm not afraid of him. I'm not afraid that he's angry with me because I made a mistake. I'm comfortable talking to him about my mistakes and my sins because he already knows it all anyway. When God corrects me, chastises me, I appreciate it because I know that he's doing it out of love. Don't you want to be comfortable with God, have a comfortable, relaxing, loving relationship with him? If you stop dividing your life up into sacred and secular and you decide that everything is going to be sacred because you're going to do it all with and for God, In him, you're going to live and move and have your being. Like Jesus said in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. And that's what I want to believe. Psalm 127.1 says, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. 
Well, interestingly enough, it doesn't say that you can't build it, but it says your labor will be in vain. You might create something or build something or build some big business, but if you're doing it so you feel important, so you make a lot of money, you're not doing it for God, you're not doing it with God. No, you go to church on Sunday. You pray when you have a big disaster, but most of the time you don't need God. You just do it on your own. You're kind of proud of yourself that you've been a success. But you know what? All that is wasted. It's all in vain. You can build it, but it's not going to give you joy. It's not going to give you peace. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. No matter what we do, if it's not done with God, it won't work the way that it is supposed to work. Matthew 16, 26 says, What good would it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? I want to ask you a question. You may have to think about it when the program's over, but who and what are you living for? Who and what are you living for? Are you living for God? Are you doing what you do because you believe you're doing it in obedience to Him and because you love Him? Or are you just kind of doing what you want to do and asking God to bless it? You know, we don't plan and then pray God will make our plan work. We pray for God to give us the plan and then we walk the way He wants us to walk. Our greatest fear, I didn't say this, but I read this somewhere and I think it's great. Our greatest fear should not be in failing, but in succeeding at things that really don't matter. Wow. What are you putting your time into? Is it something that matters? Is it something that matters to God? You don't have to be in ministry, public ministry, on a platform to be in ministry. I think we're all called into ministry, but your pulpit might be your backyard fence. And you don't necessarily have to preach to everybody. You just need to get out in the world and live your life with and for God. He's not a sideline. He's the main line. I want you to enjoy your walk with God. For in Him we live and move and have our being. Okay, now here comes a scripture that could be just a little bit Mm, ouchy, but I think we want to read this today. Revelation 3.16. So because you're lukewarm, and that's what I used to be, lukewarm. I mean, I loved God. I was born again. I believe I would have gone to heaven if I would have died. Our salvation is not purchased with any of our works. But we do earn or lose rewards for how we live our life and what we do while we're here. So I would have gone to heaven, but I would have never enjoyed my life. And the Bible says in John 10, 10, the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came that you might have and enjoy your life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. Well, I didn't have that. I didn't have that. I didn't have joy. I didn't have peace. I was not enjoying my life. I was even in ministry, and I wasn't enjoying that because I was too busy trying to impress people or impress myself. I I don't know. I loved God, but I wasn't living my whole life with and for God. I was still dividing all these things up. I was lukewarm. And God wants us to be zealous, passionate, enthusiastic, on fire. Paul told Timothy, stir up those embers that are in you. Get passionate again like you once were for the work of God and for God. You know, sometimes when we first come into a relationship with God, we're so excited and we're so passionate and we just we want to study the word all the time and we want to do things for people and we want to give. And boy, if you're not careful, after a while, what was once a raging fire can just become a few embers 
Well, Timothy still had a few hot coals in there, but God said, you, you got to, through Paul, he said, you got to stir yourself up. And I want to encourage you today, if you're just kind of a lukewarm Christian, stir yourself up. You say, well, how do I do that? Well, one of the ways you can do it is by sitting around and just really thinking about what God has done for you and what your life would be like without him. And start doing everything you do. Just whisper a little prayer. God, I want to do this with you today. I want to do this for you today. I'm going to the grocery store, but if you can use me while I'm there to be a blessing to anybody, show me what you want me to do. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Of course, I can't hear you saying yes or no, but I'm going to believe you're saying yes, Joyce. We get it. I kind of hate to read this next part to you, but it's here, so I have to do it. Revelation 3.16. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Now, I'm going to be very honest with you. I don't really know for sure what that means, but it sounds bad enough that I don't even think I want to look into it. Nothing is worse when you're really thirsty than something lukewarm. And let me tell you, we have got a thirsty world, a hungry and a thirsty world that's looking for something. They don't even know what it is. They're looking for God, but they're trying to fill up that emptiness in them with all kinds of other things. And those of us that are Christians... We're the only Jesus that they're ever going to see. And we need to get on fire for God, get a smile on our face. There's nothing worse than a sourpuss Christian. Get a smile on your face. Go to work. Don't complain and grumble like everybody else. But when everybody else is complaining, say something positive. Well, I'm thankful that I have a job. All the circumstances may not be perfect, but I'm thankful I have a job. There's so much negativity in the world today. I am so tired of all the negativity that we can inject some positivity everywhere that we go. Be in love with God. Don't just love him, but be in love with him. I kind of remember when I made that transition. It's like, I love you, but it's more than that. I'm, I'm in love with you. I can't live without you I can't who would want to even get up in the morning if they didn't have Jesus I wouldn't see any purpose in it and I have to stir myself up sometimes you know I work pretty hard at what I'm doing and I study the Bible all the time and I write all the time and sometimes I'm like (sighs) but then I remember how blessed I am that God could have chosen anybody but he chose me and the good thing is, is you, you are gonna, you're gonna like your life so much more if you stop dividing everything up and you believe that God is with you all the time. The Bible says He'll never leave you nor forsake you. But He'll be with you at all times in everything that you do. And the Holy Spirit is sent to be our helper. And God said He sent Him, listen, to be in close fellowship with us. I love that close fellowship with us. God is with me right now as I preach, and he's with you as you listen. But when the program's over, you don't have to say, well, the spiritual part of the day is over. No, the next thing you do, you just do it with and for God too. I'm telling you, if you can get this, this will change your life, and it will bring so much joy into your life that you just won't hardly know what to do with yourself. I can't really even explain what a big difference it makes. It's like, okay, you're still cleaning your house, you're still doing your laundry, but now you're doing it for a different purpose. You're doing it because you love God and you want to take care of the things that he's given you. God loves us so much, and the least, the very least that he deserves is our all. Maybe what I'm saying today is all or nothing. Don't be lukewarm. Don't be lukewarm. Be red hot on fire for God. The very least he deserves 
is our everything and our all. Acknowledge God in everything you do. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and mind and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. Another translation says acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. You know, something simple like going to the grocery store. I mean, you know, it can be a nightmare or it could be a pleasant trip. So if you acknowledge God when you go, Lord, shop with me, lead me, guide me, show me what to get. Help me. Let me tell you something. I, You know, maybe you're better than me, but I need help in everything I do. I need God to help me fix my hair. I need God to help me with everything. And I remember when God touched my life back in 1976. And I didn't know anything about living like this at all. As I said, I was a lukewarm Christian. And I did love God, but I, I wasn't in love with him. And he was important to me, but he wasn't my all and my everything. And I thought just because I went to church on Sunday and said a little prayer and read a little bit of the Bible that I was okay. But I don't want to just be okay. I want to be everything that God wants me to be. And so on a Friday, I think the month was February in 1976, I was crying out to God in my car on my way to work because I was just fed up with living the way I was living. Arguing with my husband, being mad at my kids, no joy, no peace, feeling sorry for myself all the time. That's not the way a Christian's supposed to live. And I cried out to God, God, you have to do something in my life. And you know what? I think I had just gotten desperate enough that I didn't care what it was as long as God didn't leave me the way that I was. And all I can tell you is on my way home from work that night, God touched me. His presence filled my car. And I felt like I'd been filled full of liquid love. Now, you might say, well, Joyce, I've never had an experience like that. Well, I don't think you have to have an experience. God knows what we all need, and he'll give each one of us what we need when we need it. If you start crying out to God to fill you, he will fill you. We all need to be full of the Holy Spirit, be baptized in the Holy Spirit, full of God. Not just a little bit will do you, but be full of God. And I bowled on Friday nights in a league And this was a Friday when this happened, and I was still kind of like in the afterglow. I just felt, oh, everything was beautiful. Everything was wonderful. But I was bowling really bad that night. And I heard the Spirit of the Lord speak in my heart, why don't you ask me to help you bowl? And I thought, well, you don't care about my bowling. And see, that's where I was all wrong. God cared about everything that I did. He cared about my bowling. Well, you know what? I went ahead and I prayed, and I started bowling better. And I'm telling you that if you will let God into everything you do, whether it's your bowling or cleaning your house or driving to work in traffic or paying your bills or whatever it is, start doing life with God. Don't just try to do life on your own and then go to church on Sunday and be miserable the rest of the week. Oh, I wish I could see you. So I could tell if you're getting this or not. Because I'll tell you, when God becomes the center of everything in your life, everything changes. You shall have no other gods before me. Let him be number one in your life, the most important thing in your life. Seek first the kingdom of God, and everything else will be added unto you. You know, our mind and how we think about all these things is so important, and today we're offering you my all-time best-selling book. It's over 20 years old, but it's still one of our best-selling books, The Battlefield of the Mind. We've sold almost 6 million copies of this book. And so that means it must be pretty good. And we're offering it to you today for your gift to the ministry of any amount. Just do the best. Send in the... Be generous. 
And we're going to use that money to help hurting people all over the globe, people that are hungry, people that are poor, people that are needy. We're going to use it to preach the gospel. And remember what I said. In Him we live and move and have our being. Do life with God and dedicate everything you do to Him and do it with Him. We love you so much and I hope that you enjoyed today and that it helps you and changes your life. Thank you for watching. The Joyce Meyer Conference is back. If you will start crying out to God on a regular basis, I need more of you in my life. You better put on your seatbelt and get ready for the ride of your life. Coming to Hershey, Pennsylvania, November 4th and 5th with worship by Mac Brock. The way she connects with people, I mean, you can't help but to leave energized. For more information and a complete conference schedule, visit JoyceMeyer.org or call 1-866-C-JOYCE. Some people just push your buttons. And no matter how hard you try to love them, they take you from zero to on edge in no time flat. So how do you see the good in people when it's really hard to find? Joyce Meyer wants to show you in her new book, Loving People Who Are Hard to Love, a step-by-step -step survival guide to help you navigate those difficult relationships and a world in need of God's love. Loving that difficult person may not change the world, but it could change yours and theirs. Loving people who are hard to love. Order your copy today. We hope you enjoyed today's program. Please contact us or visit JoyceMeyer.org to share your prayer request or partner with us in sharing Christ and loving people all across the globe. This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries.
This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. Well, thank you for joining me today on Enjoying Everyday Life. Today, I'm going to be talking about doing life with God, not dividing our life up into these are spiritual things, so they're sacred, and all these other things are secular things, and so they're kind of unimportant, and I need to rush through these so I can get back to being spiritual because maybe I feel like that God likes me more when I'm being spiritual. If I'm in church, I feel spiritual. If I'm studying or praying, I feel spiritual. But if I got to do the laundry, then yuck, that's not spiritual. Sotela na kabo hamar 
गोपालगढ़ हमर उमरा 